السلام علیکم خواتین حضرات وسیم ایسر ویلکم سی یو ٹو لیکچر نمبر تھرٹی تھری آف مارکیٹنگ فار نان پرافٹس ایم کے ٹی سیون ٹو ایٹ ایٹ دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان دی کمپوننٹ آف لرننگ از گوئنگ ٹو بی ایٹریکٹنگ ہیومن ریسورسز وی آل نو دیٹ نو آرگنائزیشن ان دا ورلڈ وتھ مے دیٹ بی نان پرافٹ آرگنائزیشن اے کمرشل اینٹیٹی اور اے گورمنٹل آرگنائزیشن کین سروائیو وتھ وتھ آؤٹ دی ایگزسٹنس آف گڈ ہیومن ریسورس ناٹ اونلی دیٹ any organization needs to have human resource it needs to have good human resource so it is a huge challenge for non-profit organizations to look for good human resource which really can help the organization achieve its programs and hence its mission if we go back to the concept of strategic intent we will know that uh, it is all about putting together uh, human resources material and financial resources with the various capabilities of the organization and core competences together and then leveraging all those in order to have a good, effective strategic intent. So in other words, if we do not really have good human resource, the whole strategic intent uh, is of no use. And hence, we can say that um, it is uh, the basis of for the, all our strategic actions that the, we undertake Uh, within an organization. It also goes without saying that it is the strategic intent which eventually translates into uh, the mission of the organization which is externally focused as compared to the intent which is internally focused. But the fact remains that both are driven by humans. So the human resource is of utmost importance. May that be a matter of strategic intent or for that matter, mission of the organization until the time that we have human resource of good quality that we are not going to be in a position to be able to outcompete our competitors and therefore npos have to have good human resource but here you see the challenges that non-profit organizations could get into a little more difficulty than their commercial counterparts in order to look for good human resource for the simple reason that Human resource within commercial organizations are paid very well. They are paid according to the market price. But conversely, on the nonprofit side, we have a problem of um, available financing. Because of the fact that uh, nonprofit organizations mostly are short of funds, they are not really in a position to pay their human resources as well as their commercial counterparts do. Uh, so for that matter, what really happens is that uh, Non-profit organizations could have to uh, offer remunerations to their human resources, which are a little below the par. Not only that, they also could have to look for the volunteers who really can help the organization move forward. And we all know that the volunteers have a great role to play when it comes to uh, execution of programs in any non-profit organization. What the simple reason of not having as much of the financing as uh, our commercial counterparts are endowed with. And by the way, that uh, may also take us back to the concept of uh, having a good pricing strategy which enables the organization to generate as much revenue as possible, the meaning to the extent that uh, we are in a position to uh, recover uh, with almost all of our operating costs uh, lessening our dependence on um, outside funding, which comes um, toward the organization uh, by way of uh, donations and uh, the aids of different kinds. So uh, what I'm saying here is that uh, for the reason 
that non-profit organizations are not in a position to pay to their staff members as well as uh, commercial organizations do, they have a greater challenge uh, of um, recruiting a good quality human resource. Uh, and alongside with that, a good quality for the volunteers. The volunteers, uh, as a matter of fact, are not the ones who charge the organization. They work without any compulsion or without any coercion, but the fact remains we do need volunteers. Why do we need this kind of combination? And what is the right balance between the regular staff and the volunteers? Uh, it is going to be a topic of uh, a separate component, but here, my point is that commercial organizations are better off when it comes to recruiting human resources in comparison with nonprofits. For another reason that commercial organizations are mostly driven by established systems. Because of the fact that they have very good systems in place, those systems take the human resources within the organization along with their current. And this, of course, is not to say that uh, the human resource of um, poor quality can also uh, sustain uh, itself uh, within established systems. The point here is that established systems uh, help a lot uh, in terms of grooming people, uh, sustaining people, and then making uh, the better use of those people who stay with the organization for a long time to come. Conversely, when it comes to nonprofit organizations, it is generally seen that the NPOs move from the program to program. In particular, when nonprofits are operating within the area of the social marketing. And because of that, the nature of transition, the nonprofits really get into the predicament of hiring as many volunteers as possible and at the same time retraining their regular staff members for a new program and for a mission which may be a little different from the one the people really have been used to. And therefore, we can surmise the one particular fact that whereas commercial organizations depend a lot on established systems, nonprofit organizations depend a lot on people. In nonprofit organizations, uh, the volunteers the work at various levels of the organizations. Uh, the starting from the lowest to the possible level, they are uh, the resources that you find even at the highest possible level. There are members of the board of directors who help the organization move forward, and they are the ones who volunteer their services in their respective fields. And we know that we have directors from the different areas. And the very reason that we have those directors with different professional backgrounds is because we want those directors to be helpful in those particular areas where they really belong. So uh, looking at uh, these uh, the differences uh, which nonprofits uh, have uh, in comparison with uh, their commercial counterparts, there always is a need for the volunteers. And the volunteers or the volunteerism is something that we need to understand in absolute detail. Whereas nonprofit organizations run into huge challenges of hiring good quality human resources, they also have an advantage in hiring those people. Uh, this is very interesting. So in other words, we can say that it works both ways. So in the first place, if they are constrained, in the second place, they really are advantaged. Where they are advantaged, that is something that we have to look into. We all know that nonprofit organizations could have a very expressive character. And that expressive character is the one which really entices the people toward those organizations. And because of the fact that the volunteers, or for that matter, the regular staff members are in a position to express the kind of commitment they have toward the cause, they can express their the contribution. And by expressing the, their contribution, they can actualize uh, the certain the values the which they the harbor the very close to themselves. And they think uh, that they uh, the need to 
do something good to the society either because they want to pay back to the society, either because of the fact that they want to be counted, because of the fact that they want to improve their skills, and so on and so forth. There could be so many different reasons for the volunteers to work for the organizations, but the one fact is that nonprofit organizations do offer a remarkable platform where people have the opportunity to express themselves. So it is this particular expressive character which attracts the human resources towards the nonprofit organizations. Volunteerism is uh, something uh, which, as the terminology suggests, is not uh, undertaken in return for uh, any financial gains. Uh, the people who volunteer their services are the ones who want to work for a non-profit organization because they primarily and essentially believe in that particular cause and they want to make their contribution just like I expressed a while ago. And therefore, uh, the volunteerism uh, is uh, something which is uh, uh, one of the strong bases of uh, putting together uh, the human resources required to the, take the organization forward. As I have uh, pointed out earlier, I think uh, at uh, the more occasions than one, that in developed societies, uh, in the United States in particular, uh, the young people who are in the teens and also a little beyond their teens do uh, work for uh, the nonprofit organizations uh, because they want to volunteer services uh, for different causes. And they do it uh, not only uh, because they, uh, they believe in the cause, but they also going to do it from their own vested perspective, and that is to get better jobs later in their life. Because once they have on their resumes the service that they have rendered uh, alongside a nonprofit organization, they really can brush up their uh, resumes and leverage the experience they can show on the resumes and. Uh, uh, going to find better opportunities later in life. So this is uh, the one aspect of uh, the volunteerism that uh, uh, really uh, motivates uh, the young people to uh, work for a certain cause. This uh, may not be the case in our society, but uh, as uh, the many other concepts that look uh, very foreign to us, um, a few years or a few decades backwards, uh, are very much relevant and contemporary in uh, today's Pakistan. So uh, by that particular uh, context, uh, we can assume that uh, this uh, the particular uh, development or uh, the phenomenon of uh, the young people in the teens uh, working for uh, different organizations uh, on a temporary basis uh, for a short while during their summer vacations and so on and so forth in order to uh, develop uh, the certain skills um, to gain certain experiences uh, by interacting uh, with society at large and by working with professionals uh, who are part of the regular staff of the nonprofits can really uh, brush up their CVs and hence uh, be in a better position to place themselves uh, in the job market in their later years. The organizations uh, where uh, the volunteers uh, work are from different areas and uh, that's uh, the one thing that I think I've been talking about uh, all along the course and uh, the such organizations uh, could be in the area of uh, the education, in health like hospitals and uh, the dispensaries, uh, there could be in um, uh, preservation of culture like uh, we uh, keep on uh, the talking about preserving uh, the arts and crafts and uh, there's so many different manifestations of uh, the history that uh, need to be preserved. And uh, you may have uh, the volunteers uh, working for such organizations only because they have uh, a love uh, for that particular mindset and uh, that particular cause uh, which they think uh, is noble and uh, society will benefit if that cause is uh, fulfilled. Other areas are like environment, humanities, uh, so on and so forth. But there could be uh, so many different areas in which nonprofits operate. Uh, uh, any area of uh, the social, uh, the marketing, uh, where uh, you have the mission to improve the society at large. Uh, maybe by way of uh, the carrying out a family planning program or an anti polio campaign and so on and so forth. The fact is that uh, the volunteers 
because they do have an opportunity of working in so many different varied areas and functions. Distribution of jobs among uh, the different industries in which uh, nonprofits exist and operate could look like the following. We have different kinds of jobs for which uh, the volunteers opt. The jobs could be at a uh, low level and the jobs could be at a very high level. And the jobs may also exist somewhere in between. And therefore, depending upon the demographics of the population that is into the volunteerism, um, the organizations come up with the right match between the right bunch of the volunteers and the cause at hand. So therefore, you may find people offering their services in transportation. Uh, if you go back to the example of uh, the food bank, I think uh, they, they may need uh, the young people who can uh, transport uh, the, their daily supplies to needy neighborhoods for distribution of food. Um, you know, once they have collected from restaurants or from the banquet companies, um, and you will recall I talked about the food in excess, which could be collected in a very organized manner and then uh, distributed um, among needy neighborhoods which are in need of food. So you may have volunteers who offer the services in transportation, or you may have the volunteers who may offer the services in carrying out certain administrative uh, work. Um, you may find uh, the volunteers at schools, uh, colleges, and universities that happen to be nonprofit organizations offering their services in student counseling. And again, in uh, the certain administrative uh, jobs, uh, you may find um, the volunteers in hospitals and dispensaries, and you may find the volunteers at the top, top level as the members of the board of directors of nonprofit organizations. Here you see the job that takes on some added significance, with which I'm gonna talk about as part of another component. But the fact is that uh, the jobs of the volunteers um, are offered in so many different areas and they are dispersed all along a very wide spectrum of different kinds of jobs in so many different kinds of organizations. The question here is, why is there a need for volunteers or volunteerism? Well, we need volunteers because we basically deal with charities and charitable organizations in the context of nonprofit organizations. So as long as we have charities and charitable organizations and we have certain causes to, to fulfill, we always will need the services of volunteers because we cannot sustain ourselves with the help of just regular staff because we are always with a short of funds, in the meaning that we as the nonprofit sector. And I keep repeating that precisely is the reason that the many nonprofit organizations like to be independent and the self-sustaining the entities whereby they can generate their own revenues by selling their services and products by having core missions which can be sold like uh, the hospitals and universities, whereby they can generate funds to be able to at least to pay according to the market standards um, to their human resources or to their regular staff members, so to say. But um, the fact of life is that uh, that is not the case um, in every instance. That we do not really have nonprofit organizations who can be self-sustaining or who are in a position to be able to generate their own revenues and not going to have any dependence on outside funding. The fact of life is that outside funding in the form of donations, grants, and aids of different kinds um, are needed. So given that, that, we do need volunteers. And the fact is that uh, the volunteers and uh, the volunteerism are as old as uh, the civilized world. So in other words, the concept and the phenomenon uh, go as far back as uh, humans started uh, gaining the semblance or the appearance of uh, civilized creatures or existence. So in other words, 
uh, ever since society has been kind of a civilized society, and of course, relative terms in relation to the time uh, when each society existed, uh, volunteers and the volunteerism uh, have existed. Um, we do see a lot of the manifestations of uh, the phenomenon of uh, the volunteerism uh, by way of uh, giving and uh, doing some work for that particular giving. When it is a question of giving something, it has to be organized. And that is the way societies could have been organizing uh, such givings in the past. And out of this giving stemmed what you may call community reciprocity. On a reciprocal basis, the people help each other in different situations from time to time. And based on that, in the present days, the modern world, what we see is the voluntary organizations. These voluntary organizations are the ones that have taken on the shape and form of nonprofit organizations. And these are the ones that are involved into so many different kinds of social causes that have been around for a long, long time. And like I said, the date back to antiquity. Uh, you know, that, that exactly is the statement which you wanted to make. Now, there are so many reasons uh, for people to be helping hands in different situations. And uh, this holds true for all societies. If you take the example of our society, I would say, and you will agree with me, that a lot of the volunteerism stems from our religious values. And it is because of those principles and tenets that we like to charity and then we like to work for those charities and we like to be part of those charitable organizations. And that is one of the strongest bases of the volunteerism in our country. If you take the example of a country like Japan, you may not be surprised to know that the volunteerism or helping each other is deeply, deeply embedded in their traditional culture. And it is because of those cultural values that the Japanese also like to work for organizations that are out there to help communities at large and to work in those areas where they think governments may not be in a position to offer as good service as a privately owned or a privately organized voluntary organization that they might be able to do. So we have different levels of volunteerism in the different countries, even in countries like the United States and United Kingdom, we see a lot of nonprofit organizations, or for that matter, private the voluntary organizations that are involved in the kind of services and activities that I talked over the last you know the few minutes. The fact is that the reason you know whether you have charitable organizations or the privately owned voluntary organizations in a society is that governments and the private sector are not really in a position to solve all the problems of the society. So in other words, we can very confidently say that the level of the volunteerism or the existence of the charitable organization, organizations rather, is directly proportional to the ability of a government to offer uh, the services to their citizens to their fullest satisfaction. So in other words, if the governments are not in a position to 100% uh, satisfy their uh, inhabitants or citizens, then there is a vacuum. And that vacuum is fulfilled by private voluntary organizations. In a country like the US, or for that matter, in the UK, uh, they have what they call the model of uh, the welfare capitalism. And uh, the welfare capitalism uh, takes those uh, organizations exactly toward uh, the direction that I've been talking about. And they offer services in different areas, uh, which could be either education or health or, you know, human services, environment, and, you know, so on and so forth. There could be so many different areas uh, where they work. Uh, because of the simple reason that governments uh, by themselves are not really in a position to uh, fully satisfy their citizens on so many different camps. 
there are different models in the different societies. If you take the example of uh, the Scandinavian countries, uh, they have a model uh, which is known as the social democratic model. And the fact is that the amount of um, charities or the level of volunteerism and uh, the existence of uh, the charitable organizations in Scandinavian countries is at a very low level in comparison with many other advanced countries like the US and the UK or Germany and France because uh, the social democratic model takes care of so many different social needs of their citizens within the society. And hence, less and less need for um, welfare capital or for that matter, need for uh, the PVOs, meaning privately owned with the voluntary organizations. Then we had a very interesting model a few decades back, which was the socialistic model that existed in the former states of uh, the Soviet Union. If uh, we take a look at uh, the states uh, within the former uh, the Union, we get to the uh, conclusion that uh, those states that have come a long way uh, from that socialistic model to democracies like Russia or other republics of Eastern uh, the European continent are not in a position to uh, fully satisfy their citizens on so many different social counts as they were when they operated under that socialistic model. Now, this is not to say at all that the socialistic model that was a better model. I'm not talking about, you see, the pros and cons of different models. All I'm talking about is how different the models the work in different societies toward um, addressing the certain social causes and uh, the certain uh, factors responsible for uh, the social ills and uh, then uh, how they take care of uh, the, all those ills uh, by way of uh, the putting together their efforts in so many different forms. Somebody does it by uh, what they call uh, the, you know, welfare capital. Somebody does it uh, by way of what they may call a social democratic model. And in a country like Pakistan, of course, uh, we do that a lot on you know, personal, individual uh, basis uh, out of our religious values. And uh, the fact is that uh, individual contributions, they do matter a lot. And if you remember correctly, what I talked about in one of the previous components, uh, the individual donations are the dominant donations as part of the overall donations that are generated through the different kinds of foundations. And individuals, of course, the meaning a mix of different foundations and individuals are responsible for donations. And out of that, individuals um, stand for the dominant part of donations that come uh, to different NPOs. Now here, um, we can say and summarize that uh, the, uh, the absence of um, a very well-established or a well-entrenched uh, governmental uh, the mechanism uh, is responsible for emergence of uh, voluntary organizations that uh, spring up uh, on the scene and start doing what could have been the job of the government or for that matter, what also could have been undertaken by the private sector. And you and I know that uh, the private sector in today's the modern world is a lot more uh, concerned about their social responsibility than what the sector um, was sensitive to, say like a few decades back. And because of the social responsibility factor, private sector plays a lot of role, uh, sometimes independently and sometimes in collaboration with nonprofit organizations. And that precisely is the reason I'm talking about the um, existence or the importance of the, you know, the private sector that it may take toward addressing the many social causes. So uh, wherever there is uh, an absence of a system uh, which could be a combination of the governmental system and the private uh, the sector system, uh, the not being able to address all the issues in a society, then voluntary organizations could do come up and uh, the people like uh, the you and I may like to work for those organizations, for those causes, 
uh, either as regular staff members or as the volunteers. There are different reasons for these voluntary organizations to be successful in the different societies. And the one of the reasons I think that I have really um, put a lot of emphasis on, and that is the absence of okay, the very well established systems on part of the governments and the private sector. Uh, there are a few okay, the more reasons okay, why uh, voluntary organizations are okay, the more successful than um, the governments or the private sector. Now, this again is not to draw a comparison okay, between their okay, organizational capabilities or their okay, organization promise, okay, the meaning. This is not pitting the uh, voluntary organizations against the government or for that matter, the private sector. This talk is uh, being given uh, in the context of uh, the vacuum in which these uh, the private voluntary organizations or uh, the PVOs operate. And uh, what I want to share with you guys is that uh, the PVOs could be very successful in any society because of a given set of reasons. Well, in the first place, it is the vacuum. And once they find the vacuum, they fill that vacuum very effectively. Here, the question is how and why they fill that vacuum effectively. For a couple of reasons or a set of reasons, one being that they are not bureaucratic. These organizations are very grassroots organizations and they are fully knowledgeable about the social ills or the economic problems that society at a very grassroots level is facing. And therefore, they um, create their existence and uh, they uh, create a certain reason for their being, like the why they exist. They have a certain purpose to fulfill and based on all that, they create a mission. And then they start working on the mission and they follow that mission with a lot of zeal and enthusiasm. And the part of that zeal and enthusiasm is people like you and I, who work as either regular staff members or as the volunteers. So going back to the reasons, they're not bureaucratic, they are very clear about their existence, their purpose, and the grassroots level, which uh, is uh, absolutely essential for them to understand uh, where the society lacks some basic things uh, which must be addressed. And then they are not politicized. They do not uh, really have interference uh, from uh, outside quarters, in particular political quarters. Uh, I mean, that kind of uh, interference uh, is found uh, when governments operate and uh, those uh, become uh, meaningful obstacles and uh, stumbling blocks uh, for the governments to move forward uh, with the speed and with the efficiency they may otherwise like to do. So I'm not saying that uh, the political interference is uh, always responsible for uh, creating those stumbling blocks. All I'm saying is there is no such political involvement at the level of PVOs and they are uh, independent of uh, this particular factor uh, which uh, makes them more efficient and more effective. And another uh, the factor uh, which is about finances is that PVOs do not have the kind of overhead costs uh, which encumber commercial entities. They have costs within their certain uh, the budgetary limits which are defined uh, by taking into consideration so many different parameters. And uh, I think the most important parameter is the one which is about their inability to generate uh, as much revenue as they may otherwise have liked to do. Uh, they do not have uh, the kind of revenues that should be uh, sufficient to sustain those organizations. And that is why they intentionally keep their overhead costs uh, within um, controlled the budgetary limits. That's what they try for. And the Ultimate result is that uh, they are in a position to have uh, lower overhead costs and uh, being uh, more effective in terms of cost control. But then, of course, uh, the PVOs uh, have to 
uh, with generate funds from outside sources. And how they do that? I think that we all know by now um, how they generate to the different donations and to the funding and so on and so forth. The categories of services or for that matter, the industries within which uh, PVOs operate could again be varied. Um, you know, starting from the health and education to environment. And the fact is that uh, we, in our society, have uh, PBOs that are uh, working in the area of microfinance. I don't really want to name uh, those uh, organizations. Uh, that's for you to carry out a certain level of research to find out there are uh, uh, organizations like that uh, which are successfully operating for the last you know, couple of decades offering uh, the microfinancing facility to the village folks. Um, and uh, the, the fact of uh, the life is that, uh, that they are successful. And I would say that uh, the most important and uh, the biggest gauge of their success is by way of looking into the recovery rate. It is, uh, in most of the cases, remarkable. Uh, much better than with many uh, commercial banks and uh, development finance institutions. Again, not to draw a comparison is the objective here. Uh, the uh, real objective here is to bring home the importance of uh, the PVOs, uh, why they exist. They exist in that particular vacuum that I talked about, and the vacuum exists uh, because the governments, in particular, followed by the private sector, are not really in a position to um, fully satisfy the needs of uh, the citizens of a particular society or a nation state, and therefore uh, the voluntary organizations get an opportunity to spring up and start working on a particular mission. Here, there are uh, two the more dimensions to such uh, the voluntary organizations which I must talk about. Um, when they offer the services in different societies, Okay, may that be Pakistan or may that be the US, they offer okay, the one of the two roles. So in other words, there are two fundamental roles which the voluntary organizations play. The one is known as the service role, whereas the other one is known as the expressive role. I think it is a very interesting uh, the differentiation between the two roles. The service role is the one uh, with which we are all very well familiar. And that is the role um, to which I keep giving examples and the whole course uh, basically revolves around. Uh, there may it be uh, the formulation of strategies, starting with the strategic intent and the mission of the organization, right down to uh, all kinds of uh, the executional uh, tactics. Uh, it basically is the service role uh, which is all about offering a particular service. And those services are offered in so many different areas uh, which I keep talking from time to time not at the, not with the objective of repetition, but to see with the objective of drawing your attention uh, to different building blocks of knowledge. And those areas are again, to see the education and health and humanities and culture, environment and the social services of different kinds and so on and so forth. So that is the kind of uh, uh, service role with which these the voluntary organizations play as the part of their existence. The other role is the expressive role. This is the role whereby these organizations help people actualize their values, actualize their preferences. How do they actualize their values and preferences? Because they offer those people a wonderful platform where they can express their values. And that exactly is the point that I talked about at the start of this component, when I said that you know, the voluntary organizations of that matter, nonprofit organizations can have a very expressive character. And it is because of that uh, the expressive platform that uh, the many people uh, do get an opportunity to express their values and their preferences uh, by um, proving to themselves or uh, not proving to anyone, uh, still uh, fulfilling certain uh, self-esteem needs that they could be good to the society. So this is the expressive role which is played by voluntary organizations by way of educating people in the areas of, uh, for example, um, drawing attention uh, of general public toward abiding traffic rules. 
is an expressive role which is played by uh, you know, non-profit organizations or the voluntary organizations. There could be so many different uh, the kinds of such roles. That when you start educating uh, the society in terms of uh, the preserving um, your natural resources or not littering the environment, you are undertaking an expressive role whereby you are trying to influence the behavior of the target population. And this is what the marketing is all about. You try to influence behaviors. And this is a classic example of influencing behavior of your target market or target audience or population uh, by undertaking an expressive role whereby you help people on the one hand uh, to actualize their own values and preferences and on the other hand uh, they're doing a great service to the society. Um, if you take a uh, good look at uh, the different countries, uh, I can say that uh, with the help of the examples given in the textbook that uh, the countries like uh, the United States and uh, the United Kingdom uh, have a very high level of uh, the service role organizations that offer different kinds of services within the society and involve a very high level of for the volunteers from uh, the young population. And then we have a few uh, other countries also that are very advanced and rich, I would say, in terms of their uh, the service uh, the role. And uh, it is very interesting to note that uh, the countries like Colombia and Brazil also are uh, the part of uh, the, the club of such countries that really is dominant in terms of uh, taking up the service role. And then you see we have uh, the countries that are uh, very rich in terms of undertaking expressive role. And you know, uh, the Germany, uh, the France, and a uh, couple of other countries do happen to be quite advanced in this particular aspect. This is not to say that they are not into service role. They're also into service role. Uh, but then you see uh, what is interesting is that uh, the newly uh, created democracies like uh, some countries in East uh, the Europe and uh, also in Latin America are the quite far ahead in terms of undertaking the uh, expressive role. And I think it goes without saying that uh, the countries which are not very strong in terms of their economies or in terms of uh, knowledge-based economies uh, they should be the ones to undertake uh, the expressive role because they need to educate their population in so many different ways in order for them to become the better citizens of the society. We can talk about so many different examples from within our society. There are organizations that really have been and are excellent at offering different kinds of services. And may that be ED uh, Foundation or uh, Shaukat Khanum Hospital or Sin Institute of uh, Urology, um, known as SIUT. Um, all these uh, organizations uh, are excellent examples of offering uh, services uh, as uh, the service providers. Uh, they are into the service role uh, mode. Uh, but then you see that we do not really have many, many organizations that could be cited as uh, the absolutely world class when it comes to offering uh, an expressive role. And I would tend to think that uh, in our society, there is a tremendous need to have uh, the intervention at uh, the both levels uh, of uh, the roles offered by nonprofit organizations. In the meaning, not only uh, we need to have organizations that uh, offer excellent services um, to the society, uh, but we also need to have organizations that could be really the good at uh, the offering good education to society at large in terms of uh, the so many different social issues. And therefore, we can say that there is a tremendous need to have the good people that are working for nonprofit organizations who can offer again these kind of services. We started the component with the need to have the good human resources because the overall topic is attracting human resources. And just to give a summary of the whole phenomenon, let me say this in a few words that uh, there is no uh, non-profit organization which can operate uh, without the help of good human resource. And the fact is that uh, there is no organization uh, in the world that can sustain itself uh, without uh, the existence of good human resource because it is the good 
human resource that is responsible for putting together all of the resources of the organization together. May those be you know, money resources, meaning finances or material resources, and they are the ones who are responsible for putting all the strategies together as the part of the overall strategic formulation for the organization. And they are the ones who are responsible for execution of all the strategies, and therefore, they have to be excellent people. But then you see, I talked about the one particular important constraint that nonprofit organizations face in comparison with their commercial counterparts, and that is their inability to attract as good human resource as others do, meaning their counterparts do. And I cited different reasons. Um, we they must take a good stock of all those reasons responsible for uh, the challenges that are faced by nonprofit organizations toward uh, the finding the right human resource because they're working for their organizations. And then I talked about uh, the need for uh, the volunteerism. And this basically stems from the fact that uh, the nonprofit organizations are uh, always uh, the short of funds in most of the cases, meaning they do not have ample funds. And therefore, they need to have the volunteers. They also need to have volunteers because they may not have as established with the systems as their commercial counterparts have, because they keep on doing the same thing over and over again. And therefore, uh, nonprofit organizations who are into uh, the social marketing in particular should be the ones very sensitive to having the good resources at their disposal whenever they are undertaking. A new program, and for that, see, they need volunteers. We need volunteers because uh, there is a need for charity and charitable organizations. And as long as charitable organizations will exist in the world, we always will need volunteers to work. And we also have learned that we need to have volunteers at different levels of the organization, offering different kinds of uh, the functional help to nonprofit organizations. Um, you know, starting from the lowest rung of uh, the functionality, which maybe the transportation of trucks, um, uh, right up to the level of uh, the board of directors, because we may have volunteers sitting at different uh, the levels of the organization. And then uh, I talked about uh, the different models that different countries have within um, their uh, systems, uh, within their governing systems or within their societal systems okay, to help uh, their okay, the citizens. And uh, voluntary organizations play a very significant role toward that. And there are two roles they play. One is the service role and the other one is the expressive role.